So what we're going to be looking at today is uh, similar to last week, uh, where, you know, again, an overview of the class, kind of how we've been doing this over the, the starting last week, the way we did this. But uh, today we're going to be reading a news article. Uh, last week we watched the Dodge Ram commercial and the Volvo commercials and talked a little bit about faith discourse coming out of those. Today we're going to be reading an article, and, and what, I, what I want you to do here in a moment is to break into your groups to discussion to kind of discuss, read, take give you time to read the article and discuss this. And again, thinking about it from the standpoint of the, the handout about walking through the various strategies that are involved that are getting used by, by the article from some of the themes and some of the things we've talked about, about how we're consuming media. Work through that part of the sheet. And then as you flip it over, it's the transition to faith discourse about the ways that the ways that the article is written, written, the ways the information presented, what some of the information presents and how it may be calling upon us as Christians, as followers of Christ, to do something different than what God calls us to do in his commandments. I said I'm always going to go through this each week. Uh, I don't think that uh, the article we're going to read here in a moment is going to be necessarily contentious, I don't imagine, but just a reminder of the idea of rules of discussion that it's less about the actual details. I think we might get into details with this one just a touch today, but it's typically less about the details. It's less about the issue, but really thinking about how this information is presented, what kind of values it's conveyed and the ways that the information is presented. Um, just thinking about this rules for discussion and then using those values, using those ways that it's presented to then transition to what, how that differs from what God's, how God calls us to live and following his commandments. Um, I'm going to stop there to see if there's any questions from anybody about before we dive into this. Otherwise, I'm just going to let you sit in your groups for maybe, let's say, eight to ten minutes. Take time to read the article and then work through the handout that has the, the front page side would be the kind of working through the context, the demographics, um, the pieces about, you know, kind of product, market, and strategies. Work through that part first and then flip it over and work through some of the pieces about the Ten Commandments and some of what this article may be asking us to stray away from there. All right, so let's uh, eight to ten minutes starting now. Go ahead and read and discuss. Thank you.
All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and pull them all back together and discuss, uh, see what kind of great discussions we had about bringing in and bringing in anything else. So we can go and slide down. Um, what I want to do is start with the sheet on the top side where it says uh, basic media analysis. I kind of walk through some of what your discussions were and some of these components of how you read this article, what you saw in it. And again, just kind of any, any of these pieces about things you discussed at your table about context, product, target market, strategy. Who wants to go first? Nobody. Let's sit down. Let everybody think for a second. Oh, yeah, go ahead.
Yeah, so we're talking a little bit about, you're, you're talking context in terms of the broader context. I would meaning, just like to say as the resident southerner that our lakes are always hot and we're not worried about them either. <laughs> I, I'll make fun of myself for a second because context in some of this would be more so thing for me thinking about how did you find the article? And admittedly that I found this article, which means that somewhere I was scrolling on Twitter or scrolling somewhere, and this article popped up, the headline popped up about, you know, brainy eat amoeba that infected swimmer in Iowa. I thought, well, I should read this. This might be a good one to use for a class. So <laughs> the context was 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 whatever my social media feed was. That's where you found it. Yeah. They're hungry. <laughs> Just stay out of Iowa. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I think if we think about this too, and, and go ahead and raise your hand, obviously, if you want to chime in on these pieces, but if we're talking about product or target market, you know, whether I'm the target market or not, because it was on my social media feed or how this all came together, but but I think it's helpful to think about this idea and this whole sense of this attention grabbing headline that's supposed to grab your attention like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. This is something you really need to know. And whatever way that maybe on social media, again, I think it was Twitter. I don't remember where I saw it now. But um, recognizing that there's some algorithm behind all of that that's driving me to advertisers. There's some aspect that they're collecting information because I clicked on this link that it's ultimately about how they're potentially utilizing my information, utilizing my electronic data to drive me to advertisers. And the more engagement they get, the more clicks they get, the more all those kinds of things they get, um, the better sense of who, I don't know what, I don't know what the direct product they think I might need when you read about brain eating amoebas is, but um, yes. So I think it's that kind of thing. What does everybody think about, the, the piece that I think is really interesting here is, is just the strategy, you know, in terms of logic or character or emotional strategy about, how this article is written the way that it's written, you know, because there's a lot of information here, and I, I would I would even say that a decent amount of the information is true. But in terms of how they do it, how they present it, what kind of strategy they're trying to use um, in terms of presenting the things that mostly are true. Lori, yeah. The thing, fear factor is part of this, and they're they're trying to stack it with science. So yeah, I know there is some science to that, but they're really putting that fear factor in there. We go from Iowa all the way over to California, and they're saying that you know the, the latitude, the, the latitudes aren't the same. You know, and the two totally different stories, but they're combining, they're they're linking them together to to bring that fear factor in. Well, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely playing on fear, <laughs> playing on the notion of so whoever I am that I clicked on and read this article, and then what happens later if I'm standing in the grocery store, getting ready to buy my groceries. And well, I hope I don't get a brain eating amoeba <laughs> when I swim in a lake. But what does that mean for the next time I take my kids to the lake? Do I need to worry about this? Do I need to, is the lake safe? You know, and, and to, my answer is no, it's not, the lake is not safe. Say it louder, yeah. The answer is no, the lake is not safe. Right. And I encourage you to go swimming in it anyway. <laughs> Don't let water go up your nose, no matter what you do. Yeah. Which means there's. Bond. Yeah. I think too. Oh, I see a hand over here. Yeah, Jennifer. I think it's just a kind of news story, but from out on a slow news day. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have many stories, so we're gonna dig for something like the brain eating amoeba. <laughs> 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 
I, I agree. Yes, I think it's I think it's part of the process of the, there's the constant churn of just you need to have more content, you need to have more content, and how can you write about so many things? And, well, there's always so much happening today. I think one thing to think about this, you know, in terms of when we think about all this pieces about context and product and market and strategy is part of why I picked this is because it's so egregious and it's easy to laugh at in some ways of, okay, so this is brainy to me, but that maybe some person got in Iowa. They don't actually have, that's not even confirmed. First off, when you look at this, it's just saying, this guy swam in this lake and now he has this amoeba and he's in, he's in the hospital. So that's not even confirmed. They're just making the connection because he happened to swim in the lake. And then it's also the whole thing of, you know, the logic they use of here's what this amoeba does. So you need to know that this could kill you if you get it. Using the, using the logic of some of the data of, well, there have been five cases in the last 12 years in Midwestern states. So they're on the rise and it's because of climate change. It's because the water's warmer. And you think about the sample size, if you think about all this information that I mean, what did it say? 154 cases since 1962. And there's how many lakes and how many kids have swum in the lakes every single year or adults or whoever else it is. So the statistical likelihood is so infinitesimally small that maybe you're ever going to get this, but it gets attention as if they have enough information or enough data to say that there's some statistically relevant increase in cases in the Midwest, even though it's been five in 12 years instead of one for the 20 years before that or whatever it was. Yeah, they never that? even cite that number. What the percentage really is. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can you imagine yelling at your kid or your grandkid, hey, don't splash or you'll be 155? You know what I mean? There's a 0.0008% chance you might get a brain eating amoeba. Right. Yeah. 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 Fred. I'm of the opinion that this whole thing has been here since creation. Yeah. And People have died from this very rarely since that time, not even up to date, but it's being sensationalized today. Yeah. I see a couple hands, Daryl. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, I saw that. I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that's interesting, though, is, and this is what most people will talk over, they're very careful in the wording. They mention, they hypothesize, they suspect. There is no direct correlation, but most people are going to gloss over the fact that they're trying to make a connection. Um, and they're careful in their wording choice, but they're not coming right out and saying this is why. Because the vast majority of people will read it, skip over some of those words, and just go, well, obviously it must be because of climate change, and jump on the bandwagon. Or even if you don't even get that far, just to get to the point of all I think, all I know is there's more brain eating amoebas in lakes, and they're they're in midwestern states, and I live in the Midwest, so I should be afraid. But I think I, I think the, before we go to the faith faith discourse and some of the Ten Commandment pieces about this, the, the point I want to make about picking this article is such a great, an egregious example because it's so extreme in some ways because it's such an outlier of there's only 154 cases in 60 years and all of the things that Krista just said about we suspected we hypothesized you know they're they're making a bunch of connections as if they know this is all true, but oftentimes whether it's our politics whether it's you know things about sports whether it's just a whole bunch of different things in terms of how our news is typically presented is it's done this way it may not seem as egregious but it, i'd argue even that it is it's just it's more subtle because it's things that maybe seem more believable or it's more subtle because it might be something that oh i agree with that because they're talking about politics in a way that makes sense to me or they might be talking about whatever the issue is or maybe it's it's done also on the flip side of they're talking about an issue that that I really don't agree with. And in, in, in a way, it's it's just as egregious as this notion of a brainy amoeba that's going to mean that you shouldn't let your kids swim in the lakes or definitely don't let them get their noses in the water and all this kind of stuff, which to me seems kind of funny. I mean, it's not funny for the person that's sick, but it's funny in the sense of the scope of how likely it is that it would happen to any of us 
or any of our kids if we swam a lake in Nebraska? Iowa. Well, I'm saying, yeah. Because yeah. we're in a Midwestern state, so it could happen here too. <laughs> so what kind of things did you discuss in terms of the, the flip side of the page and you know the transition to faith discourse and thinking about you know, again, the way this is inform this information is presented, the type of information it is, the wording uses, all those different the worded usage, all those different types of things, and 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 how this is asking us to to live or think or operate in a way that's outside of God's commandments for us and how He calls us to live. Sure. One thing when we talk about a good symbol, uh, in a lot of ways, like a hat, uh, a couple of things. So my teacher and I are young, in the 30s, and the 40s, we had, a whole, we had a whole company for those of us. So we know that Ken all had degrees, we know that Jeff had degrees, and we knew why. But that was true, not in climate, in America. I, I think of the uh, Mount St. Helens that asked for him. How that completely changed the landscape in that pathway for a lot of good reasons. So I mean I'm not saying that we don't need to be good students, it's a part of the deal. But um that's kind of what we've been discussing. So I don't know if everybody heard Sharon, but she's talking some about the, the ways the climate change is discussed in the article and and I'm gonna paraphrase it in a way, you know, similar to what you said, but you know, if we think about first commandment, you know, and fear and loving and trusting in God, knowing that God holds us in our hands, knowing that God provides for everything that we need. I mean, God is the steward of our, of our environment. God is the steward of our climate. God is the one that, that takes care of everything on this earth to make sure it has life, it has breath, et cetera. And in what ways is this article then calling on us to be afraid in a way because something might happen with the climate, something is happening with the climate, and here's an, here's an unintended consequence because of this brain eating amoeba, but just the whole notion of us to not fear and love and trust in God above all things as our God, that to know that he's always caring for us because there's other thing that's outside of our control. And we need to think about what we need, what we as people could do to control our climate. Sharon also made the point, we need to be good stewards of our climate, of our environment. We certainly do. I mean, there's things we don't do with trash that we used to do once upon a time of, or dumping sewage in the river or things like that. I mean, it's, it's good to do, but it doesn't mean that God isn't providing and caring for us, Harlan. Well, let me just say that we need to be a little more careful. All blow and no go from the weather forecasters, right? <laughs> Talking about all the horrible things that are going to happen with, you know, the, the tornadoes or the the snowstorm or the hailstorm, whatever it is. And and yes, there are bad storms sometimes, but this certainly gets presented in a way there's much more doom and gloom. And and do you really trust that God's taking care of care of you in, in, in the midst of all this? <laughs> Lori. Absolutely. And Everybody, everybody hear that? Yeah, can I jump on this actually? I'm going to repeat it quick and then I'll let you jump. Just make sure everybody heard Lori. She's just talking about reading an article like this and making science your idol. The information that you know about how you're going to be safe, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to amen, but I'm going to tweak it just a little bit, Lori, okay? It's because I do religion as like my life's work. It's not an idol, it's religion. So whereas at one point in history, some guy died, they would have known it was an amoeba. They didn't have the science to know. He would have just dropped over dead. People would have said, the gods have cursed him. It's a religious answer, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and for a lot of people, and Americans are not really that scientific, honestly. We're more technocratic. We don't know how our microwave works. We just want to know that it works, right? 
Most of us don't even understand all the features on our iPhone, <laughs> but you meet someone from Germany and they can get into your iPhone for you. You know what I mean? Like we're not actually as scientific as we like to believe that we are, most of us, but science becomes the religious answer. That, that, that this religion of science has an answer for everything that happens. It's not an idol, it's religion. And, and I think to amen that as well, the, in my mind, at least the, the line's probably gray-ish, but the, the distinction for me of what, you know, when is science useful, when is science helpful for us as Christians versus the transition to science becoming your religion is when, where do you find your identity? Are you, are, do you find your identity knowing that you're a redeemed child of God, forgiven and redeemed by Jesus Christ, and so I'm trusting in God, very loving and trusting in God, knowing that he's given science to us, not in a magisterial sense, but a ministerial sense. Because it's, I need to warm up my burrito fast. Yes. <laughs> and I'm hungry. That's the ministerial sense of science. It has to work. I warm my coffee fast. Yeah, there you go. But for how often in our world the way information gets presented or for, for anyone that's looking to find that makes sense of the world, looking to find identity in the world, well, I'm going to latch on to the information that science provides because it helps me make sense of who I am, that I'm this atomistic creature, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> and so it, it becomes an issue of identity. So yes, science then becomes a religion because I'm finding my identity of who I am in this world by what science can tell me about who I am. I saw another hand. I thought, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember how fast God's world spinning that aircraft? Do you remember that? I I, I remember it to be a terrible environment <clears throat> and things will blow, but you know what? God took this world well, on fire. He put it in spin and he and it, fixed it. And it didn't um it didn't mean that there wasn't a place for volunteers to come help. Oh, right. Because <laughs> If the raccoons spill garbage in your backyard, you get out there and start cleaning it up. You know what I mean? Like, and if we make a mistake, we start cleaning it up. So it didn't mean that there wasn't a place for science or how you deal with oil or volunteers. Y'all come on and help. But in the end, all those little amoebas. Yeah, they just ate it up. Right. Right. So, it, like so what you're, fire. what I hear you pointing out is that extreme one side or the other instead of. You know, there's probably we can all go help, and yet God's still going to take care of us. Exactly. Yeah. We're old enough to have seen that. We need to yeah. reflect back on that. Well, and I think I think that you know you're talking Exxon Valdez there, and using that as an example, the oil spear was bad, and they showed pictures of all the animals that were covered in oil, and they're trying to clean up and everything like that. But I think the 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 transition point becomes we know what this is going to mean for the oceanic system 50 years from now. And we, we just, I mean, we can guess maybe, but we don't really know. Well, we know. And it, but, it gets, but, I, but I think they probably talked about it in a way of this is what's going to happen, regardless of God's provision, regardless of trusting that, you know, that there's ways God's going to work it out. Karen? It was also a great advertising opportunity for Dawn to just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and what's great about that is that you know where the product placement came. Right. Yep. Because it was Dawn next to some poor waterfowl bird thing. And you're like, oh, look at it. And then here's the Dawn. And then, uh, oh, look at it now. You know? it's got yeah, it's got bubbles all over it. It's so cute. Yeah. Elrod. Right. Yeah. 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 So for the, we, we've got about 10 minutes left and, and what, what I'd like to do, uh, you know, anything else you want to add about this article specific, specifically, but 
you know, we've been doing this for a few weeks where we kind of walk through some of these principles and this idea about, you know, what's actually helpful that I that I'm able to know as I consume media in the world that as a follower of Christ, you know, recognizing in some ways the ways that social media or your phone or other things are going to kind of force things down your throat based on trying to drive you to advertisers. Then we talked about propaganda some. I wanted to use the last few minutes here just to kind of open up discussion a little bit about in what ways maybe you've been looking at things differently these last few weeks. If any of this is starting to stick and you see things a little bit differently as, as you start to kind of unpack some of this about how information is being presented to you, what it's calling you to do in terms of strategies it's using about playing on your fear or playing on your emotions or playing on logic or even just some of the ways that as we sit and think about knowing that God provides for us, knowing that he alone is the God that we should trust in and believe in, knowing that our identity is in Jesus Christ, that we're forgiven and redeemed, how all, all of those pieces then play into um, whatever it is that you're reading, watching, et cetera, throughout the week. If anybody wants to share anything that's that's been insightful or helpful or surprising or whatever it happens to be. Yep. Everybody here, Carol, and more and more same sex advertisements and things making it seem more and more normal. Carol, what's what's kind of what's kind of your reaction or your thought when you see things like that when you're trying to look at it through the lens of your faith and, and perspective that way? Yep. That's okay. I think there's a lot of perspective issues that like the portion of it, like the number of people that that actually represents in the population versus how much it represents in advertising or like let me just for example like four thousand people die from drowning swimming every year. But we're talking about fifty over sixty years. Seven so that yeah, yeah. So Renell's talking about just how much, you know, as we're consuming media and whatever that looks like, having an eye for perspective and proportion. You know, perspective again, maybe is is in some ways the perspective of how does this information actually impact me? And not in a selfish way, but just recognizing that the information get may get presented as if it's applicable to everyone and it may not be applicable to you. But proportion also in the sense of you know, even she mentioned the, the brain eating amoeba article again. The headline is this, you know, that it's infected a swimmer in Iowa is increasingly found in northern states, increasingly found. And, and again, the proportion is tiny. She mentioned that Brian looked it up and what do you say, 4,000 people, 4,000 people a year drown swimming. And here you've got 154 over 60 years. But this might make it seem as if this is worse than drowning. Slower. <laughs> you want me to share with that with the whole group or you? <laughs> yeah. A joke over here about whether maybe that's his problem that he has a brain in me, but so. <laughs> any other thoughts, comments? Oh, Rick, yeah.
if it really changes in order to fit what the federal budget data is going to fit. And in what in what ways you're utilizing data to then just to describe or talk about a narrative? I got a, I got an amen. Wait. All right, all right. My voice is not doing well today. I'm gonna I want to amen this and I want to take it back to scripture for a second. So you said you've got a data set and it depends on how you read it. Okay. Uh, what is the question when Jesus is arguing with somebody in the in the gospels? What is he always arguing over? Did, did he argue over which scriptures they were reading? So that means he's arguing over what? How you read the data set. How you read the scriptures that are in front of you. They're not arguing over the scriptures. It's the same bounded set. It's, it's called canon. It's a bounded set. And so it's the same set for everybody. It's the same scriptures for everybody. They're not arguing over what they're reading. They're arguing over how they're reading. And Jesus is telling them, you're reading it wrong. So it, it's not just scriptures, or it's not just a data, an empirical data set. I love that we call it an empirical data set. It, anything you're reading, the question is not just what are you reading. The question is always comes down to how are you reading it? And do you know the moves that you're making mentally when you do? Richard. So maybe the brain eating amoeba was really just a message for the surgeons that are looking for biological control for brain tumors. Yeah. Maybe you're just introducing an idea that it has a lot of Yeah, yeah. It's a Canadian tour as a board. Any other final thoughts for today for the good of the cause? It's Shane, yeah. So I just think about media as a, as a larger product. Jen and I went and saw the new Thor movie last week. And within about a 15 minute period in there, we were exposed to homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexualism, polyamory, and free love orgies. Um, That's a packed 15 minutes. Yeah, it was, and it was really back to back in there. Um, at least we did say, <laughs> but uh, you know, one on one hand, we we're thankful that the kids were with us, it was just us. But on the other hand, we, you know, as we think about it, we got to be cognizant of what our children are consuming and having those conversations with them because they're, they're getting exposed to this stuff other places. They're going to they're gonna see it just to the same degree in different, different mediums or different places, and to be intentional about how do you actually then frame it or shape it or help them understand it again from a Biblical identity of who God has made us to be. Yeah. Jennifer. I mean, at the end of the day, the whole uh, concept of things such as this, and I would call it a game, is uh, taking God out of the equation. And we as humans, we have complete control. Amen. Yep. Time, you can take God out of the equation. There you go. And that's that's the game. Take God out of the equation. Take God out of the equation, and where else can I make sense of how I make sense of life and who I am? Yeah. I think the other thing is you have to ask yourself who you trust. Yep. Can you trust everything you read? Well, who do you trust? Who's writing it? What's the agenda behind it? We need to know those things. Because yeah. I mean, to your point, I don't know if everybody heard, but who do you trust, and what's the agenda behind some of the things that get written or spoken, and recognizing that even to, to, to Rick's point, to use that example of, of a broader data set of rainfall that you then take that and you utilize it in with a preconceived narrative that you want to, that you want to talk about. I remember teaching critical thinking to children in school and um, going from <coughs> perspective to perspective and then deciding and now we're bombarded with one way of looking at things. They don't teach critical thinking in school anymore. They don't do unfortunately. That anymore. Unfortunately, yeah. Chris, do you teach critical thinking in school anymore? We do here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> public school. Public school. Public school. No. I, I think I think they do, but I think that um, to 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 the point is that the way information is presented to us isn't presented in a way that 
asks us or gives space for us to think critically. It's just saying, this is what you should think. Yeah. They, they are teaching critical thinking, but the, and in public schools too. But here's the, here's the thing. For a while, there wasn't another narrative that was robust enough to replace the narrative of the God who sent his son to die on the cross to rose again. So everything that the wider American culture wanted to do that wouldn't have fit with a Christian and, Jew and Jewish hegemony culturally, right, meant that they had to appeal to like just personal liberty or freedom. Okay, so whereas in the 1950s, if Hugh Hefner and other pornographers want to get their smut out there, they appeal to the First Amendment. Now, if you want to pack 15 minutes full of no holds barred sexuality into a Thor movie, you're appealing to the narrative of lifestyle and, uh, and, and sexual identity. So you don't have to appeal to the First Amendment anymore in, in liberty because they've come up with a story of identity that they think can compete with the story of identity that you know in your baptism. So if the story of the, of the narrative is racial or sexual or uh, political or whatever, then that can now compete as a robust narrative alternative to the narrative that you were baptized into, which is the narrative of the God who sends his son in the power of the Holy Spirit to die for everybody and last day on the third day. And for a while, the pagans couldn't figure that out because they didn't have a story that could compete with ours. They still don't have one unified story that can compete with ours, but they have these little mini stories that for a certain percentage of the population that ends up grabbing onto that, that's how they'll find their identity. So I'm sitting in Memphis talking with a friend of mine who is same-sex attracted, who's been in the same relationship with the same man, for years, and by now they're probably legally married. And we were talking, and at one point in the conversation, I said, but you're baptized. <laughs> Straight over his head. Because his baptism didn't mean anything to his identity. This other narrative of being a gay man was where his identity was to be found. So. They don't have one, the pagans don't have one narrative. It's not like we're dealing with Romans who have Zeus and all the gods and all that. Like, they don't have that narrative. They have these little narratives that they use, and they just appeal to a certain segment of the population. But if you can put enough of those little narratives out there, then even if you teach critical <laughs> thinking, they'll run all their critical thinking through their little mini religions, just like if we teach critical thinking, you're going to run everything that you think in terms of what you learn with critical thinking through your narrative, through your religion. You still run it through Christ. That's your filter. Does that hit everybody where they get their mail delivered or? Yeah. All right. We're over time. Five minutes. So I'll let everybody go today. We'll see everybody next week.